Today we are at America's first cathedral, the Baltimore Basilica, and let me tell you, it has stories you will not want to miss. From 17th century paintings that were almost lost, to yard sales, to the stories of the U.S.'s first bishops and the presidents and popes that have visited this place, it's an incredible story of history, but not just history, but of restoration, bringing this cathedral back to its original glory. Come on with us. So today we're here at the Baltimore Basilica and I'm joined by two incredible people. Could you guys just introduce yourselves? Carol Schaefer. I've been a docent here about uh, 10 years. Um, I am Father Brendan Fitzgerald. I am the rector of the Basilica. We start back here because this seal pays tribute to the Jesuits. The Jesuits were a missionary order of priests established in 1540 or founded in 1540 by St. Ignatius Loyola. The first Jesuits landed in Maryland on March 25th, Annunciation Day, um, 1634 in St. Clement's Island, on St. Clement's Island, St. Mary's County, Maryland. Um, Father Andrew White, two other Jesuits, and 200 passengers landed um, on a land grant from the King of England with the anticipation of religious freedom. And the first Jesuits were ordained here at the cathedral in um, 1805. And we walk up this way. Can I ask a silly question? Sorry. Certainly. Basilica. What makes something a basilica? So the cathedral is the seat of the bishop. Right. Okay. The basilica, it's and we not would just find that church. we would find that out on the tour. Oh, okay. I'm getting ahead. I'm getting ahead. <laughs> getting ahead yes. I know. Okay. Well, we'll just have to wait. Okay. Hang yeah. Tight. Exactly. You'll get the Hang tight. Yes. Okay. Um, land grant from the King of in England. Um, George Lord Calvert was friends with um, the King of England, King Charles. He was his Secretary of State and also a personal friend of his. He asked him for a land grant so he could bring Catholics to America to practice their religion freely. The first land grant was in Newfoundland. They went up there and it was too cold. They went down to Virginia and they weren't allowed to land. So they sailed back to England. He asked King James or King Charles for another land grant. Um, he died in the meantime. Lord Calvert pursued it. Then he passed away. His son, um, Charles Calvert, kept his vision alive. Um, he asked for a land grant in Maryland. He wanted to name it after the Queen of England for Protestants and um, Queen of Heaven for Catholics. They landed here, like we said, in 1634, but they found that Catholics were not allowed to practice their religion in Maryland at that time. The Puritans had a stronghold and they demanded allegiance to the King of England. 1646, Maryland passed the Religious Toleration Act. Catholics still were not allowed to practice their religion. They were not allowed to be educated. They were not allowed to vote. It wasn't until after the Revolutionary War that we could practice our faith. Um, during that time, the Jesuits became really a missionary order. They went out to churches disguised to look like houses. Uh, people got to hear mass maybe once a month at the most. So um, after the Revolutionary War, um, we established freedom and we were able to practice our religion. The Catholic population had grown substantially during that time. So the bishop or the priests petitioned Rome to create a diocese and appoint a bishop. The first diocese in the country um, was established in 1789. It went from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River, and after the Louisiana Purchase to the Rocky Mountains was one big diocese. John Carroll was appointed our first bishop. Um, he was tasked with building a church that would be a symbol of religious freedom. He had become friends with Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, and he said, who can I get to build this church? Um, they recommended the premier architect in the country at that time, Benj um, Benjamin Latrobe. Latrobe had been educated in Europe, so his vision of a cathedral was much different than John Carroll's. John Carroll wanted something light and airy. Um, Latrobe designed a building that was very gothic, dark looking, uh, stained glass windows, very dark. John Carroll didn't like that. He wanted um, the light and airy feel to the building. John Carroll won. Benjamin Latrobe submitted plans for this neoclassical building, which be, would become a symbol of freedom in, this, uh, in the new country. They broke ground uh, July 7th, 1806, and worked until 1810 when they ran out of money. Um, John Carroll held a lottery. He asked every Catholic in the country to send in a dollar to start this building again. 
John Carroll won the lottery. <laughs> Go up right here. Um, they were ready to start again in 1812 when the war broke out. So um, a, the building was under roof at that time. It could have housed some of the soldiers had they needed to, but they didn't need to. Um, they held them off at Fort McHenry. 1815, they're ready to start building again, and John Carroll passed away. Second um, bishop of Baltimore was Leonard Neal. Leonard Neal was a cousin of John Carroll's, and he was also a Jesuit. Um, but D.C. was still part of the diocese at that time, so he lived in Georgetown area. He only served about a year and a half, and he was killed in a carriage accident. Third archbishop was a Sulpician priest, Ambrose Marshall. Um, Ambrose Marshall made it his goal to finish this building. Um, 1818 he took over and by 1821 the building was ready to be dedicated. The building is dedicated in 1821. Now we're going to go back a little ways. Baltimore had become um, the, an archdiocese, but the population had grown so much that um, in 1808 the uh, priests petitioned Rome to create new dioceses. Um, five new, four new dioceses, five including Baltimore, were created and Baltimore became an archdiocese. Um, the new dioceses were in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Bardstown, Kentucky. The priests, right. that went out, <laughs> the priests that went out to staff those new dioceses were um, ordained here at the um, cathedral. Wow. Um, and, uh, some Jesuits, some Sulpicians, but mostly lay priests went out to staff these dioceses. Okay, we're going to stop for a minute because you asked a question. I'll put it in here. Yeah. Basilica, Cathedral, Shrine, and Church. You guys got a lot going there. <laughs> oh yeah, we do. We do. And we use them interchangeably, but there are slight nuances. We are church okay. because we have Mass here. We are a co-cathedral. There are two cathedrals in Baltimore. Um, the Archbishop can choose to live at either one. But this is the seat of the diocese, so this is a cathedral. A basilica is a special designation given by Rome to a place that has historical significance. There are four major basilicas in Rome and about 1,700 around the world. This is a minor basilica. Okay. It's not the first basilica. We weren't named a basilica until 1937. But we are a basilica. You do not have to be a church to be a basilica. Elizabeth Ann Seton Shrine in Emmitsburg is a basilica and a shrine because she is the first American saint. We have a gorgeous church around the corner, St. Alphonsus. If you've not been there, it's a lovely church. It's a shrine and it's a church. And completely it, different in design yes. from the basilica. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I've seen pictures. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, so it's a shrine and a church, but not a um, basilica or a cathedral. We said two co-cathedrals, Mary our Queen up the street about what four or five miles mm -hmm. up Charles Street um, opened in 1959. It's a co-cathedral but it's not a basilica or a shrine. So there are slight nuances to the words but we are all of them. We are a basilica. We have it all going on everything. here. Yeah. I love it. Is okay. it common for a city to have co-cathedrals? It that? is not. Okay. It is not. So, and there's a, there's a story there uh, okay. The very short version is that a wealthy Catholic business owner during the Great Fire of Baltimore uh, made a promise to God that if his business was delivered from uh, being burned, he would bequeath his estate to the church. Oh, wow. Uh, and the fire stopped just down the street and his business was delivered. So when he died, he left everything to the archdiocese, but with the provision that the uh, estate be used to build a new cathedral. Uh, okay. So uh, the archdiocese, I think, and folks up at the cathedral would know more. They did what they could to see if the funds could be reapportioned because we already had a cathedral, yeah. but the will was ironclad. So uh, the Two time came that is. they said, let's build a second cathedral. And you need to work with folks in Rome in order to get uh, a special designation really for a co-cathedral. It's not, it's not ordinary. Okay, I hadn't um, heard of that before. Yeah, so, so it's the, and the cathedral will be well worth a visit at some point. Uh, it is very different from this basilica. Uh, it is neo-Gothic in design. Okay. It is absolutely enormous. Wow. Uh, seats well over 2,000, I think, if you fill okay. the side chapels. Um, it's, it's, it's magnificent in its own way. Um, and I think what's beautiful now, and Carol will talk about the restoration of this basilica, but uh, since that restoration, 
these two cathedrals are just very different in terms of style yeah. and, and atmosphere uh, and, and wonderfully complementary, I think. So, wow. well, yeah. I mean, Baltimore is known for many things, but never known in a such uh, a place that has so many beautiful churches. So, is, that's something we, that we have much, we have much going for us. Yeah. yeah, we do. We're very blessed. Okay. That's awesome. We'll take it back away, Carol. Okay, okay. Um, so, we talked about uh, restoration. Archbishop Laurie is our 16th Archbishop, so we've had 15 before him. Each one that's come in has made some type of a change, and each rector has made a little changes too. Um, <laughs> kind of like when you move to a new house and you want to redecorate it. So over the years, um, the look and the feel that John Carroll and Benjamin Latrobe wanted changed dramatically. Dark green marble floors were put in. The pews, the mahogany wood pews um, were all the white pews were all changed to dark mahogany wood. The walls were painted a dark battleship gray country, uh, color. Um, during probably about the 1940s, stained glass windows had been put in. They were absolutely gorgeous stained glass windows. Old Testament story on the top, New Testament on the bottom. They were beautiful, but they made the church feel dark and foreboding like John Carroll and Benjamin Latour wanted to get away from. Um, all of the original plans are stored in the Archdiocesan Archives up at the seminary. So an architectural committee poured over those plans and made the decision, since they had to do some maintenance work anyway on the church, let's put it back to the way um, John Carroll envisioned it. So 2004 to 2006, 30 month, $34 million restoration. Um, big brouhaha about the windows. Some people wanted them. Cathedrals have windows but this one didn't originally. So they put the distressed looking glass back in the windows. Um, they painted the walls the original color. They put the two-tone two -tone pews back. They put the white floor back. And so now we have the feel that Benjamin Latrobe and John Carroll wanted um, when they originally designed the church. And those windows went to St. Louis and Clarksville Parish, right. which, is, which is wonderful. So St. Louis and Clarksville is a parish that's very large in size, and they were building a new church at the time. And they knew they so, were going to get And they knew them. they would need windows, so yeah. we were able to keep those windows as a part of the sort of the legacy of the archdiocese. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah, but still restore this basilica to the original vision. I love yeah. that, because I think there's been so many churches that have been kind of stripped of their mm -hmm. kind of original character. I know the uh, cathedral in Chicago, for instance, seeing old pictures of what it used to be versus mm -hmm. what it is now, it's, it's night and day different. So right. it's very cool that here you have what it was designed to look like. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Um, and we have the organ. It's original to the, kind of, to the 1821 <laughs> dedication. It's been restored twice, replaced once, but they kept the federal casing and some of the pipes. It was purchased in 1821 from the Thomas Hall Organ Company in New York, largest organ in the country at that time. We use it now for, I guess, the 1045 Mass? In particular, yeah, yeah our, our Sunday liturgy. Sunday liturgy. Yep. We used to call it a high mass when I was growing yeah. up, but now it's uh -huh, the music okay. mass, yeah. Um, the back balcony. The back balcony, um, was original to the church. In the early days of the church, there was no offertory collection. Um, churches made their money by what was called a pew tax. The pew tax was 10 to $12 a year. The more you paid, guess what? The closer to the front of the church you got to sit. So you had it, literally cheap seats. Oh yeah, <laughs> and if you couldn't afford the pew tax, you had to sit in the balcony. Okay. Or if you were a freed slave, you had to sit in the balcony. Um, it was not exclusive to the Catholic Church. Other churches also had pew taxes. If you go into some churches, you see little um, brass plaques on the sides of pews. Those people had paid for their pews. Even if they didn't attend services that Sunday, nobody else sat in their pew. Um, the pew taxes, they can't find any record of them having been collected here past about 1921 but they weren't officially done away with until Vatican II in the 1960s. Okay. Um, this balcony over here was used, oh, this balcony was opened up again in the restoration and put okay. back. This balcony over here was um, originally designed for, uh, to be used by a group of nuns, but the Carmelite convent around this corner on Eager Street had its own convent and Carmelites are cloistered, so sure. they didn't uh, need the balcony. We use it today mostly for when they film, right? For yes. filming, for, for overflow seating, for certain, okay. certain events, uh, if we host an ordination. Nice. Uh, usually we'll fill the basilica That's and uh, we'll, we'll need the, over, <laughs> the overflow uh, seating, mm -hmm. so we'll seat in the balcony and uh, above here as well. Any so, idea how many of this seats, roughly? About 750. We're thinking 750 to 1,000. Okay. I think That's if you pack, like you if you pack right, this exactly. in, yeah. yeah. 
So, yeah. It yeah and if it's summer or winter, mm -hmm. coats and all that, yeah. yeah. But what's marvelous is they knew how to build a church back in the 19th century. <laughs> they really did. So even 100 people fills the space very well. Mm. It um, does. So, it scales. Um, it scales down, well, yeah. It's really a masterful design. That's um, cool. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful gift. Mm -hmm. so. um, the domes. The dome you see up, I don't look up because it makes me dizzy, but <laughs> the dome. Um, Benjamin Trobe was not a big fan of skylights. He designed this without skylights in it, but okay. Thomas Jefferson was a big fan of skylights. So um, skylights are in. Sometime <laughs> during the 1940s maybe, um, whether they just needed repair or whether it was because of the war, the skylights were all painted over, covered, uh, covered up. So that contributed to the dark feeling that the church had. 2004 to 2006, they opened them all up and we have light in here again. And the way it reflects, the way he designed it, it's just some some hours of the day are just beautiful, the way the light reflects It's magnificent. And we have the lights on. We're actually in the middle of a, a lighting restoration project here. And you're about four days early. We finish on oh, Tuesday. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it's fairly bright in here, but on average during the day, you don't, you don't need much lights. artificial lighting because wow. uh, if it's, especially if it's sunny outside, the, they knew how to build churches. It's just yeah, uh, the lighting. The, the lighting is natural and it's magnificent. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And uh, the dove, it's it, the whole dome is called the Oculus, okay. and um, the dove in the center has about a three-foot wingspan, <laughs> just to give you some type of. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, the dome, uh, the arches that you see around the dome. Above the arches are four frescoes: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with their biblical representations. They were in the original plans, but uh, really couldn't be done. In t when you move into a new place, you don't have money to finish everything at one time, so they weren't uh, put in until about 1870s. Archbishop Spalding. There again, in those restorations of some of the archbishops, um, they were covered up. So they were discovered again in the 2004 restoration and brightened up. Wow. Um, this one back here um, has a signature of, the, signature of the artist and they were able to trace his family and have them come to the reopening of the or dedication in 2006. Wow. Mm -hmm. The two smaller domes were bald for a long time during the restoration. They contracted with um, an artist in New York to paint representations on canvas like pie pieces, a uh, representation of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary because this is the Basilica of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Above the altar is a representation of Christ's ascension into heaven. Um, because the church was dedicated on Ascension Thursday, 1821, and consecrated on Ascension Thursday in 1876. Oh, wow. In those days, they did not consecrate a church until the debt was completely paid off. Um, the church could still be used. We still had masses, we still had sacraments, services here, but it was just a dedicated in 1821. 1876, Archbishop Bailey consecrated it. Um, when you walk around, you will see, and I think we can't see, there's a, concept, there's a candle up there with a cross behind it. There are 12 of those around the church where he consecrated the church, placing holy oil or holy chrism to represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Um, that was Ascension Thursday, 1876. Stations of the Cross. The Stations of the Cross were a gift from an army major for the consecration in 1876. But there again, it, they were one of those things that didn't make one of the cuts when one of the archbishops decided to remodel. Hmm. So they were put down in the undercroft, which we'll, we will go down to. At that time, the undercroft was kind of like a cellar where they stored things that, you know, uh, just were going to be used later, maybe. Anyway, they were brought up 2004 restoration. They were in pretty bad shape. They had hung here for many years and then down in the damp, musty basement. So they needed cleaning. Uh, Walter's Art Gallery is a couple of blocks from here. So restorationists from the art gallery cleaned them, but they really needed to be restored. Monsignor Art was here at that time, and he had parish families adopt a station. It was about four to $5,000 a station wow. to restore those. Uh, number 10 was pretty badly damaged and needed the most restoration to it. But now they're back up, and um, I think it was about 2013, 14, maybe, that they came back up. They're beautiful. Because Baltimore is the archdiocese, it was the premier see for council meetings. Okay. There's two kinds of council meetings, plenary and provincial. 
the only way I can remember which is which is thinking of intramural, intramural or intramural sports. Okay. Intramural being just within the school. So that's the provincial council meetings, plenary council are all the uh, dignitaries from all the churches in the country. They had a lot of issues to go over, um, education of slave children, education of um, Indian children, defining the sacraments, um, starting Catholic schools. So this is a list of the council meetings that were held here at the cathedral and the dates that they were held. I don't think we've had a council meeting here for a long no. time. They yeah. don't do that anymore. Something of the past. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I don't. Uh, I, am, I don't have the uh, the authority. <laughs> I lack the power. <laughs> um, this statue of Pope Saint John Paul, who visited here in 1995, said mass down at Camden Yard. Um, oh. It was carved from a photograph taken of him and presented to the um, cathedral. A bronze bust of Saint Teresa of Calcutta. She was here in 1996 with a. Um, a group of her nuns, and this was uh, commissioned by a visitor to the basilica and presented to us um, on display here. It has a different feel from each side where you look at it. Here's another one of the consecration crosses, the cross with the candle in front of it. Okay, now we can move up. Right. Okay. And do you guys, are these for, are these are confessionals? Right? These are confessionals. Okay, yeah. nice. So, yeah, we have uh, quite a bit of confession during the week, twice a day. Nice. Uh, before our masses, okay. and um, the archbishop. So, I am a, I'm a rector, okay. and a rector is a person who is appointed to serve, uh, to sort of run, manage uh, a cathedral, okay. because the real pastor of a cathedral is the archbishop. Okay. But archbishops or bishops have usually dioceses to run and other responsibilities. Yeah, so there's a there's a delegate in a sense appointed okay. to to manage things for him. So the archbishop has his uh, personal uh, confessional across the way. Okay. Um, he helps sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. depending on his schedule uh, and when he's having mass here. And he has but, two uh, cathedrals. And he has two cathedrals. Yeah, so he's going back and forth. But we have our the confessionals are beautiful here. Yeah, um, they are. Yeah, they really are. And. Uh, so we hear a lot of confessions. It's a very nice. active parish. I wanted to make sure to point that out because something yeah. we talked about before we started recording was the fact that this isn't just like a museum, right? Correct. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a living, breathing church, it which is. I think is a wonderful yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, yep. awesome. Well, lead the way. I keep okay. it up. Okay. This is a bust of John Carroll, our first bishop. John Carroll was born in um, 1735 in Upper Marlboro, Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, in those days, remember, Catholics were not allowed to practice. Catholics couldn't be educated. So wealthy families sent their sons over to the Eastern Shore. There was a school that educated young men, not young women, um, over on the Eastern Shore. After they aged out of that school, typically they were sent to Europe to further their education. Um, John Carroll, his brother Daniel Carroll, and his cousin Charles Carroll, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence, um, were educated in Europe. After John Carroll graduated, he decided to enter the seminary over there. He entered the Jesuit seminary, became a priest, and tutored sons of wealthy families in Italy. Probably about the 1770s, um, the Jesuits had a falling out with Rome. The Pope felt they were becoming too powerful, and he failed to recognize them. At that point, John Carroll came back here to this country. He was um, an emissary, went with Benjamin Franklin to Canada to persuade Canada to support us in the Revolutionary War. That's how he made all of his connections. When he came back um, here and uh, was one of the missionary priests that went out to the mass houses to say mass, um, 1789, when the uh, bishops petitioned Rome to create a diocese, he was the obvious choice to be nominated to become our first bishop, and he's credited with founding Georgetown University. This is a bust of Cardinal Gibbons presented to the Basilica in uh, 1924 by his fellow priests. Um, Cardinal Gibbons was actually born in Baltimore, was baptized here at the cathedral. When he was about five, his um, father took them back to Ireland, the family back to Ireland. His father passed away, so the mother brought him back here to the United States. Um, he worked to help his mother support the family, but decided that he wanted to enter the seminary in um, his teenage years. He entered St. Charles Seminary in uh, Baltimore County, became a priest, and was ordained here at the cathedral. Um, he went out to subsequently uh, staff Fort Knox in Kentucky. He was in Richmond, Virginia. He was over in uh, Fells Point area. Um, he lived at St. Bridget's Parish and rode across the harbor to 
uh, what now is um, Our Lady of Good Counsel at West St. Lawrence at that time to say Mass there. He was really a big advocate for the blue collar worker. Baltimore was a port city at that time and um, he advocated for the rights of workers and he came, became very popular among the population and also among the hierarchy of the church and um, politics. He was a good friend with Teddy Roosevelt. So um, the fellow priest presented that bust here in 1924. This is the bishop's chair. It's called the Cathreda. It's where the word cathedral comes from. Archbishop Lori or cardinals would sit here when they say mass. Uh, Father usually sits on the other side. Monsignor right. sit on the other side. Um, but the bishop or higher up sit in this chair. This one um, was only moved when uh, Pope St. John Paul said mass down at Camden Yard. They took this Cathreda down uh, for him to sit in. Above the Cathreda is a coat of arms. Each diocese has a coat of arms. Each archbishop has a coat of arms. This is Archbishop Laurie's coat of arms. Okay. Unique to all the coat of arms in Baltimore, on the left-hand side um, is the Calvert Cross, and there actually is a Calvert Cross that each archbishop has worn when he's been sworn in as bishop here in Baltimore, and the Star of David. The green hat and the green tassels indicate that he is a pastor, a bishop of an archdiocesan church. Um, should he or when he becomes a cardinal, it'll become a red hat and red tassels on the side. On the right-hand side of the coat of arms is Archbishop Laurie's personal input. The three billets on the top represent three like items, the Blessed Trinity, and um, they're from his family's coat of arms. The lion in the center, the gold lion on the red background, is from Cardinal Hickey's coat of arms. Archbishop Lorry was Cardinal Hickey's secretary in the Archdiocese of Washington. And the bottom fleur-de-lis represents his devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, Charity in truth is his motto and the banner on the bottom. And um, it's what he uses in all of his writings in Catholic Review. Wow. I love the details okay, that the are everywhere. <laughs> there's nothing there's, oh, yeah. there's a reason for everything, isn't Correct. there? I, I bet that makes it nervous. Like, she said, you know, so far, every, like, rector who comes in changes a little something. Like, mm -hmm. Don't mess that up. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the good news is we have a... Uh, we have an archbishop to run all of our ideas past. Oh, that's good, that's good. Uh, and then we have, uh, at the Basilica, we have a historic trust that was established oh, okay. in the 1970s to manage really the, the capital uh, expenses of the Basilica. And so Which any, any they're, they're fairly <laughs> enormous. So anything we want to do uh, to the, really to the physical building, even to moving plaques or statues, uh, tends to get run past someone with a historic trust. That's good. Uh, you have levels of parishioners who volunteer and they have spent their lives here. You want you don't want to upset those folks <laughs> either. Like uh, taking so. out the stained glass windows, right? Correct. <laughs> and that's yeah. why the CO4, um, uh, the Jesuit seal is in the floor. They didn't approve it being put in the wall, the historic trust. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then we do have the, the actual, you know, the historical society uh, of Maryland. So this being a historic site, uh, we have to maintain certain benchmarks. So we don't get to do everything we want. And that's okay. <laughs> and that's probably a good thing. A little so. bit of red tape to go there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, the altar. The back altar is called the Ambrose Marshall Altar of Reservation. It okay. was original to the 1821 dedication. It was a gift from the faculty members. He taught at a seminary in Marseille before he came oh, over wow. here. John Carroll brought a group of Sulpician priests over here in 1821 to teach, um, no, not 1801. You can edit that out. <laughs> yeah. um, in 1801 to teach priests in this country. So the back altar was a gift from those priests. The retable that's on the top of it was added probably in the 70s. And um, the crucifix and candlesticks are original to the dedication. They were gifts from his uh, fellows, uh, from his students at the seminary in France. The two angels that flank the side are called the Raphael angels. They're another thing that didn't make one of the cuts in the re uh, renovations. They were found downstairs in the Undercroft area and they were in pretty bad shape, but they were brought up in 2004, restored, that anyone would put those in. Put, put those in. And there were <laughs> yeah. four of them, but no, only two were down there. Um, they were brought up and restored to look like marble, but they're actually carved wood. Really? And we'll walk behind that and you can that tell that they, yeah, mm -hmm. that they are carved wood. The front altar was put in um, after Vatican II when the priest turned to face the people. Um, it's a composite Italian marble to look like Italian marble, but they put it in on runners to move back and forth so the altar could accommodate 
um, any number of priests or concerts. We have concerts here. Okay. The Catholic um, Charities has their Christmas concert in December, and um, Justin Tucker, opera singer, kicker for the Ravens, yeah. he sings at that concert. Oh, right. And so they move the altar back and they can they can adjust. Plus the priests, so when, when right. the, that bishop's conference is here, Correct. there's a lot of yeah. priests there uh, then too. Can I ask a silly question? Sure. sure. Who sits up on the sides? On a, or does anyone sit up on these sides during Mass? You mean in the, um, the sacristan yeah. or an altar server sits uh, over yeah. here? It depends on the liturgy. Okay. So if there are a number of priests here to uh, can celebrate the Mass, so okay. to share in the celebration, the offering of the Mass, uh, those priests will take most of the seats on either side. Okay. Uh, but for a typical parish liturgy on Sundays, uh, it's altar servers who are back with okay. the side seating, and lectors will be over on the side during okay. the Mass. Yeah. Nice. What was that like during your first Mass here? That has to be intimidating. I don't know where you uh, were before. Uh, this is... I was not here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was at a parish out in uh, Baltimore County, uh, outside Park. of Reisterstown. So, yeah, it was a little intimidating. Um, yeah, I have to imagine. Really, it's, uh, I think it's actually when you head up to the Ambo. And do you I guys use that Carol's, you know, We do, yeah, okay. uh, for the weekend liturgies. That was, uh, you get up there and things become real very quickly. I bet. Uh, but it's beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's what a wonderful good. place. Okay, we're yeah, back over this way. way now. Okay, because we are a basilica, we can display two items that only a basilica can display. Do not have to, but have the privilege of displaying them. One is the Canopeum, it's the papal umbrella. The gold and the red uh, colors go back to Napoleonic times. Um, this one was not used when Pope St. John Paul visited. It's a replica of one, um, but it would be used to shield the Pope from elements in a papal procession. This one was replaced, I think, about 1990. Um, we were named a basilica in 1937, and then this was replaced in about 1990, but it still wasn't used when St. John Paul was here. Altar to St. Joseph. Um, this was originally the Good Shepherd and um, a Sacred Heart altar. It was originally faced that way when they decided to extend back behind the altar to allow access to the um, rectory. This was moved this way, and it was changed to St. Joseph as patron saint of the American worker in about 1890. This isn't one of the two things that it's unique to a basilica, right? Like, no. Okay. No, Go we'll ahead. see the other thing. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. This is a plaque of our rectors. Like Father Brendan told you, we are an archdiocesan parish. Archbishop Laurie is our rector, but I mean, is our pastor, but he has about 144 parishes in the archdiocese, right. and he tries to visit each one, and he's responsible for a lot of things. Wow. So we have a rector who oversees the day-to-day -day operation of the parish. Father Brendan has been here over a year now, Just right? Just a year. Just a yeah. year, yeah. So years? this is a list, yeah. Once I, once I complete my term of service. Yeah. Oh, afterwards. Yeah. So afterwards. And, afterwards, and, and we like never know when that'll and be, and right? You have no idea. <laughs> There you yeah. go. Well, may it be long from now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this plaque over here, I, I, I find it interesting. Yeah. Um, it lists the attendees at the uh, third plenary council meeting, which was held here in Baltimore in um, 1884. It was the largest council meeting outside the Council of Trent. Um, in the early days of the church, there was no uniform way to teach religion. Uh, people learned their religion from stained glass windows. They were like the picture storybook of the time. Um, they learned it from their family. Um, after the invention of the printing press, there was more printed literature available, but still not a uniform way to teach Catholicism. So this council in um, 1884 was tasked with coming up with a way, a uniform way, to teach religion. So they met in the rectory over there, um, for 30 days in November and December and came up with the Baltimore Catechism. Wow. It was a way to learn religion. We all used it growing up. You all are too young to remember. But it was like, who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? And you memorized pages and pages. I know people that still love that it. That still love it. Yeah. It is. It's amazing. It's a wonderful way to learn religion. Probably about 1970s, they stopped using it. Okay. And it was more of a talking rather than learning religion. Okay. 
Um, harpsichord, do you want to speak on this? Why we I don't have know this much about here? it. We don't uh, either. It was a gift to Archbishop Glory. It was a gift Glory. to Archbishop Glory, and so we now have this harpsichord, uh, which I'm told needs a little bit of restoration work. Has it ever been played? Uh, no, yeah. we've had a couple of people submit requests, but no one wants to spend the money on restoring it in order yeah. to use it. More fun it. to play it. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that happens once or twice a year. I mean, I've only been here a year, but right. I think two other parishes have reached out about okay. borrowing our harpsichord. Yes. And, you know, I say, like, you fix it, you can play it. <laughs> So, <laughs> and it's. A, um, I, a, I mean, obviously, I'm looking at a harpsichord, but like, how can you play a harpsichord? You know? It's similar to a piano. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a it's a broke uh, and pianos. I don't know much. They're percussive instruments, right? So, um, like so it has a keyboard funny. and it's okay. playing strings. Yeah, but usually at a higher pitch. Okay. Yeah. And it was uh, dedicated to Magnificat, so that's why I think Father Lou got it for Father uh, from a priest friend in uh, yeah. Pennsylvania, maybe for a yeah. yep. one board. does with the one does with harpsichords. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, this altar is dedicated to St. Michael the Archangel, okay. probably about 1879, 1880. They decided to extend the altar back this way, um, to extend the space behind the altar to provide access to the rectory. A uh, parishioner um, dedicated this altar to St. Michael the Archangel. Here are two more of the consecration crosses that you see. Now. Um, if you can look straight back, and maybe you can get a picture of these closer up, but yeah. the view from here, excuse me, Father. Um, Archbishop Marshall had so many connections, so he asked King Louis XVIII of France to dedicate or donate something for the dedication of the cathedral. That's quite the connection. Quite the connection. <laughs> so uh, King Louis dedic um, commissioned this painting. It's St. Louis V, or the Ninth, uh, comforting his troops after um, uh, in the 12th century in the war. Um, it was not completed until about 1828 and presented by his um, successor, Charles IX, presented that to the uh, cathedral. Wow. The hat that you see hanging yeah. is Cardinal Keeler's hat. Okay. And when we go to the other side, we'll explain it. All right. All right. This, you know how to keep us in anticipation. <laughs> this was all flat. They didn't put the stairs in until 2004 restoration oh. to provide access to downstairs. This was all flat until then. You can tell these are wood. I can now. Yeah. But not from back there. Even from the most expensive seats. Expensive. Seats you wouldn't. Have <laughs> yeah. The second item that only a basilica can display are the bells. The tintinabula are the papal bells. They would be used to lead a papal procession and to announce the Pope's arrival. Again, these are symbolic ones. They weren't used when Pope St. John Paul okay. visited. Did they use bells and a... Uh, and a Okay, mm -hmm. just not these. Just not these okay. two. Mm -hmm. Second hat, Cardinal Gibbons hat, hanging up here. Cardinal Keeler and Cardinal Gibbons have hats hanging on the altar. It was customary in Europe when a cardinal died to hang their hat on the altar. Europeans believed that the soul didn't ascend to heaven until the hat disintegrated. Not true. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, these are replicas of okay. Cardinal Gibbon's hat and Cardinal Keeler's hat. They did not have hats like this. Remember we said Cardinal, Gib uh, Cardinal Gibbons was very much um, a priest of the people. He yeah. didn't want any of the entrapments of office. Should he have had a hat, it would have been like that. Okay. So this is just to pay homage to the uh, custom in Europe of hanging a cardinal's hat on the altar. And this is the same Gibbons whose bust we saw. Whose bust we okay. saw. Making yep. Okay, the second painting, straight back, and you can film it close when you, we go in the back, um, is Christ Descending the Cross. It was also commissioned by King Louis XVIII and presented um, by his successor, Charles the um, Ninth. Um, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, Mary Magdalene, and Mary his mother are represented in the picture. They were taken down when they did the restoration. They, they say they're supposed to be switched periodically because of the way the sun hits them, but I don't know the schedule for that. <laughs> okay, that now, <laughs> I, I mean, somebody. Somebody, <laughs> somebody. I'm sure they had a reason, but yeah. that is, I'm so glad it wasn't lost. Yes, you and me both. Um, this picture, Madonna and Mother, came with a group presented uh, to um, uh, for, uh, Archbishop Marshall by an archbishop in Marseille. He was an uncle of Napoleon. So it came over uh, probably about the 1800s. This 1800s. cathedral has friends in high places. In high places, <laughs> yes, exactly. The balcony that you see up here, after they completed the sacristy, there was kind of an empty space there. So what can we do with that? So they put the balcony in. It was used for 
um, important people who visited. Andrew Jackson sat up there, Lafayette sat up there. I actually sat up there one day, um, but <laughs> exactly, it's only because the church was full. We couldn't sit, there were no That's seats down there, but we couldn't, you can't really see. Now that they changed after Vatican II, the line of view to this altar is good, but to the front altar, not so much. They don't use that altar. Uh, maybe the choir uses it. Up Sometimes. There. There's really just an office back there back now there. where our director of, uh, of music uh, works okay. yeah okay i imagine it has to be like the acoustics in here i mean just hearing our own voices they are amazing it, it i would is. say that the music is uh first class in this uh basilica the 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 acoustics are fantastic and actually i think it was maybe my second month here uh, the the sound system had died for a sunday so and it happened in the very early part of Mass. So I went up for the reading of the Gospel and to, to give a sermon and just told everyone we'll have to do it the old-fashioned way and trust that they knew how to build churches in the 19th century. And they did. I mean, with just like a little bit of extra uh, emphasis, the sound carries to the very back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a special place. Can we make a shameless plug for like, when could people come and listen? To, like, I know you guys have sacred music here. If someone watches this in sure. the area or something, and they want to hear it. So if you want to come to the Basilica to, in particular, hear our sacred music program, uh, every Sunday at our 1045 Mass uh, between uh, the Solemnity of the Assumption uh, on August 15th and the Solemnity of Corpus Christi, which usually falls mid-June each year, we have our Basilica Scola Cantorum, which is just a marvelous collection of musicians that uh, Samuel Rowe, our director of music, has put together, and uh, they perform magnificent work. So Sundays, nine months of the year, more or less on the academic calendar, at 1045, uh, you will be able to, to come and uh, participate in the liturgy and hear our scola perform. We also do solemn vesper services on the third Sunday of each month in the evening at, okay. uh, at five o'clock. Um, and that might get adjusted a little bit for the coming year, but all of that would be on our website and you would be able to stay up to date. But those solemn vesper services are also absolutely magnificent. Right. Um, and in well, addition to that, we'll do, a, we'll do a couple of concerts uh, each year. Um, we did one in May for the Solemnity of the Ascension this year, and uh, they come up every now and then. Um, so we just like to keep things busy and uh, to offer whatever we can to everybody to come and just share in the beauty of the place. So, I love it. Thank yeah. you for that. You're welcome. Sacristy, all yours, Father. Got a all right, closet. we have a walk-in closet. We have actually a few walk-in closets here. This is a sacristy. A sacristy is where you keep most of what you need to celebrate a Mass. Uh, from the sacred vessels that you, a priest would use at the altar to your liturgical texts, so your readings from scripture, the gospel, uh, to everything you would need to wear for mass. So for okay. priests, that's albs and chasubles, uh, like you see here. Uh, altar servers are wearing cassocks and surplices here at the Basilica. Um, so it's really just a storehouse for everything you need, and it's where everyone who's participating in the celebration of the Mass would get together beforehand to make sure we're on the same page. So uh, you can imagine for larger liturgies, uh, we'll be quite packed back here. Yeah. Um, but it is a fairly large space, uh, which is good. We need as much space as we can get. Um, now, I noticed so. a bunch of different colors here. Are those for like certain feast days? So, yeah, so the way that uh, Roman Catholics understand uh, the life of the church, we have liturgical seasons, and each liturgical season comes with a distinct color. Okay. Uh, so, we are currently in ordinary time, which is something of an unfortunate name, I guess. I mean, I like it. Uh, we are not in the period of particular uh, celebration or penance or preparation, you could say. Okay. So, Advent is a period of preparing for uh, the nativity of our Lord at Christmas. We're not in Advent right now. Uh, we are not celebrating uh, after Christmas or after Easter no when Christmas we would wear, wear, wear white. Yeah, um, and we are not preparing for uh, the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ at Easter during the Lenten season, which comes with its own shade of uh, purple. Okay. So, um, so we're in green. Green is for ordinary time. Uh, and then we'll wear white, red, and uh, purple vestments throughout the year uh, based on where we are on the church's liturgical calendar. So if you're a basilica and you have lots of priests coming for different occasions and lots of bishops coming for different occasions, you need lots of space to store lots of different color vestments. Yeah. And so we have it here. Um, 
We also were blessed here to have a number of relics. So uh, again, Roman Catholics uh, have great devotion to our saints and uh, we pray through relics. So uh, relics can be of different classes, but these are, um, these relics in particular are parts of saints of the church uh, that we can pray to. So not insignificant ones. So you're looking at some major hitters, uh, doctors of the church. All right, so St. Athanasius uh, from the fourth century, Pope St. Gregory the Great from the fifth and sixth, St. Jerome from the third and fourth, and St. Gregory of Nazianzen from the fourth century. So uh, some great, great saints in the history of the church. And um, I guess I would say these are probably some of the more underutilized uh, points of devotion in the Basilica. They're back here and uh, we kind of stand before them and around them every day. Wow. But uh, they're, they're a marvelous gift to have here. Yeah. I didn't realize that when we came in here before we were right. filming and putting our stuff down. They yeah, they're very unassuming. They don't really make their presence yeah. known. Uh, yeah, but it's a great gift. Them out for, like, all so we, all we, we did in the past, I can't remember. So Father Tyler Klein, who is the uh, priest secretary to Archbishop Lori for one saint's uh, feast this past year, I remember he pulled out the, the relic for the people to okay. venerate uh, after mass. Wow. We could do a better job of that. It's just honestly, like you coming in here, it's hard to remember that we have them yeah. because there's only so much you can display. I mean, we have a lot to offer. <laughs> Maybe that's the thing you get to change. Maybe that's the thing I get to change. So, okay. okay. Should we add the crypt? Is that Correct. Nice? Okay. Mm -hmm. Crypt, here we go. This is the crypt area. Because Baltimore has two cathedrals, the um, bishop can choose to be buried at either one, or he has the privilege to be buried at either one. He does not have to be. Um, John Carroll is buried here. Leonard Neal, the second archbishop, is buried in DC because he lived in Georgetown area of DC. Um, archbishop Bailey, whose bust is over there, was a nephew of Elizabeth Ann Seton. Okay. So he is buried in Emmitsburg. And um, we have three bishops that are buried up at the Co-Cathedral. Um, Cardinal uh, Sheehan, Keogh, and Borders are buried up at Mary Our Queen. So we have these buried here. Ambrose Marshall, who really pushed to get this cathedral done, was torn because he was um, over on Packa Street. There was uh, at Packa House now. It was the first seminary in Maryland. And he was instrumental in establishing um, a group of, of Sulpicians to teach at that seminary. And so he kind of felt like his heart was with them, but because he completed the cathedral, he felt like he wanted to be here. So they built a special container to um, display his heart at Saint, um, over at Packa House, and his body is buried here. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to ask how <laughs> <laughs> No. This is our chapel, Our Lady Seat of Wisdom Chapel. It's dedicated to the Sulpicians. Um, this chapel was in the original plans. John, uh, John Carroll and Benjamin Latrobe wanted a chapel down here because Benjamin Latrobe was working on the Capitol. He was working on a bank of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He was working on a water project out in western Pennsylvania. He was gone for months at a time without a cell phone or a fax machine. So he had no contact with the contractor for months at a time. Um, whether the contractor did not feel the weight of the dome would support a chapel down here, whether he just didn't feel like doing it, he did not only not dig it out, he filled it in with a very loose sandy soil. So this was filled in up to the base of these uh, pillars, uh, these arches, from four feet here to 15 feet down at the end. They had to dig all of this out by hand to make this chapel. It took the full 30 month restoration period, 2004 to 2006, to uh, dig it out. Um, they put in a new brick floor. It kind of matched it from a brick company that was going out of business in Ohio, got the floor. But all of these arches are original to it. And so they created this chapel down here. We have morning mass down here, weekday morning mass and Saturdays. And I think the young adults meet down here we sometimes. Do. Yeah, we use the chapel as much as we can. It's, That's so yeah, cool. it's just beautiful and intimate. So. It is. Yeah. yeah, the way they designed it is just wow. perfect. 
Okay. So we'll and you said Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. For those that aren't familiar, that's a title for Mary, correct? It's a title for Mary, yeah, for the Blessed yes. Virgin Mother. And uh, the Sulpicians who run the seminary up at St. Mary's at Roland Park, uh, that is their particular uh, like patroness, their title for Mary. And so you'll see statues of Our Lady Seat of Wisdom all over the seminary. Okay. And so this chapel is dedicated to the Sulpicians who played such an important role in the history of the Basilica. Okay, so, so. I've, I've hit the number of like, Times hearing a word that I don't know that I have to ask okay. at this point. Uh, Salutations. Is that an, is that like an order? A religious order. Okay. Uh, yeah, in our church, dedicated to the teaching and formation of seminarians of, okay. of priests. There yeah. you go. So uh, founded in France. Uh, but played an instrumental role here in the United States in the formation of clergy, okay. uh, really for the, the whole history of our nation. Okay, yeah. so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like you have um, Jesuits, Dominicans, right. Redemptorists, Sulpicians. So yeah, okay. there are different that. orders with different with different, um, well, St. Sulpice, right? Wasn't uh, that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I should have asked so and much longer, different... now, but you know. But that's okay. Yeah. Okay, this is, well, I won't talk. This is what they had changed the pews to upstairs. Um, they kept this pew after the 2004 restoration because uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta sat in it when she visited here in 1996. So this is what um, the, pews looked like upstairs. Okay, right so now. Before she was canonized, I guess? Yes. Yeah, that's just as blessed. Okay, right now we are underneath the dome. Okay. I hope they we point well. I know. Uh, we pointed out the um, frescoes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the archway underneath the frescoes. That corresponds to one of these archways. There are four of those that support the weight of the dome. Benjamin Trobe had worked on a lot of projects in London with very unstable soil, so he figured that the use of an inverted arch rather than a straight down um, column would more evenly distribute the weight of it. So there are four of these around um, that support the dome. That's fascinating. I know nothing about engineering, but it looks good. Okay, this is what it looked like before they dug it out. You can tell the soil, sandy soil, was all the way to the base of these columns. So they had to dig the whole thing out. When was this? This was 2004 to 2006. Wow, so this is, yeah. Yeah, in this order is, to restore the basilica to yeah. the original design, right? Uh -huh. You're lucky that was before you were here. That looks like Correct. a I know, you would have been work. down with the shovel, <laughs> wouldn't you? Okay, remember we said uh, John Carroll died in uh, 1815, so the cathedral wasn't done yet. His body was over in a corner over there. Um, after the cathedral was dedicated in 1821, his body was moved to this area behind that column there. Um, and he remained there until the crypt area was completed in about 1890. Um, after the 2004 restoration, two workers signed in cement, put their signatures in cement to honor the prior workers who worked down here um, in the 1860s. The original workers put their signatures in cement above oh, wow. that column, and so those uh, later workers honored the workers that worked down here to dig out and build the crypt area. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we'll head down this way. Okay, this is Benjamin Latrobe, the architect. Benjamin Latrobe was born in England. His father was a Moravian minister. He was educated in Europe. Whether um, because he was a Moravian, min because he was a minister, or whether it was customary in England, they're not quite sure to donate all your services to a religious institution. So all of his work here at the cathedral was donated. Um, he it's walked off the job a couple of times, but I guess he felt like he could. But he always came back, thank goodness. Um, he decided he wanted to become an architect in England, apprenticed at several prominent firms over there, married, had a couple children. Um, his wife died and the in-laws disowned him. So 1790s, that's when he came to the United States and quickly became the premier architect in the country at that time. Because he was working on the Capitol, he knew uh, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and consequently uh, introduced him to John Carroll. Um, worked with him on this building and one of his, he remarried. One of his sons wanted to become an architect and was working on a project in Louisiana. He went down to help him in 1820, contracted yellow fever and passed away. So he did not live to see the cathedral dedicated in 1821. 
one of his sons did come back. There's a Latrobe house across the street. I think they call that hospice, Latrobe house. And um, his son worked on the uh, vestibule and the front steps. Okay. We had an earthquake here in 2011, a 5.8 earthquake, um, did quite a bit of damage. Monsignor Art did not want to close the church at that time because several things were scheduled. I think it happened like the end of August. Um, so he contracted with a company to put up scaffolding on Monday afternoon and work until Friday morning. They would take down the scaffolding Monday afternoon, then put it up Friday morning, and uh, they would drape everything so we could, still could have services here. And he still wanted to have tours, so they had pictures like this of the dome, of the organ, um, of the altar, and we did tours down here during that time. It took a full 10 months to complete the work, the restoration. It was uh, quite extensive once they started working on it. Um, this stone was in the back of the altar upstairs. It was cracking the altar. They moved it down here um, when we did tours down here. Um, in Europe, it was customary to engrave a stone on one side when a church was dedicated and on the other side when it was consecrated. So this is the altar stone and it will stay down here. This is a tribute to Father uh, Michael McGivney, who founded the Knights of Columbus. The Knights are a philanthropic men's organization. Um, Father McGivney was uh, from Hartford, Connecticut. When his father died, he was so overwhelmed with the outpouring of support that his community gave to the family that he decided he wanted to start doing something like that. He was ordained here at the cathedral. Um, he eventually was appointed um, back to Hartford, Connecticut, as bishop in Hartford, Connecticut, but he founded the Knights of Columbus. We didn't have a chapter here until about 2013. We are a diocesan parish. We have probably 300 registered families, but families tend to move out of the city after a while when they start having children. Some of them do come back to the city um, for mass here or uh, if they have a particular uh, church that they were affiliated with, they come back, but for the most part, not. We have a lot of transient people, uh, people coming here for uh, school or uh, just temporary jobs, but th we do have a good core group now, and in, in 2013, um, they established a chapter of the Knights of Columbus, and they do wonderful work. Scholarships for needy kids, codes for kids, um, the baby bottles. They do all campaigns uh, for pro-life ministries. Pro-life. Uh, yep. Blankets for the homeless uh, during the winter wow. months. Yeah. So, so we have a good core group now, and they collect food every uh, mm -hmm. every week, every month. They deliver food it drives, for yeah. the food drives. Mm -hmm. So this is a tribute to Michael McGivney. This is the divine mercy blessing bestowed on uh, the church in 2003 by Pope St. John Paul. Um, when he named Divine Mercy Sunday is the Sunday after Easter, yeah. now, every year now. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. From, yeah, John Paul was Polish. The tradition of the devotion, yes. Yeah. A uh, statue of Christ the Man presented to the cathedral in the 1930s. It's Kentucky marble. It was setting where, where the uh, seal on the floor, the um, Jesuit seal is, it was in that little alcove, but they moved it down here when they started the restoration, and this is where it'll stay. When you come to Mass in the morning, you come in this way, so Christ the man greets you when you come to Mass. You You're all turned so. around, aren't you? I'm very turned around. Yeah. I, mean, I never realized that because I come from my house. Oh, you come from your house, yeah. Yeah, I walk up this way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the statue of St. Teresa, the little flower. It was another one of those things that they discovered somewhere. I would imagine there's a lot of articles that are um, and statues that are still hidden that you'll find somewhere. Many. But this has been down here just about a year, right? We have more. I, I mean, I don't. I, I moved the one statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe oh, into I a backside that. chapel That's just to change. create a nice uh, <laughs> prayer space. So far, no one has really yelled at me for it, but I just <laughs> no. thought it would be a nice place to have some devotion. And it is. And, uh, so. Yeah, and that's where you hear confessions when they were working I upstairs, do. Yeah, right? I do, sometimes we'll hear confessions. Yeah. This, you moved here? I did. And did we know why? Uh, because I needed to fill the space. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because this yeah. is where the statue yeah. of uh, Erling uh, Guadalupe was. was. Okay. So I found Pius X and just moved him to a okay. more exalted position. So, but um, And all of this... <laughs> we do. All of this um, is new during the uh, restoration to comply with the... Um, uh, bathrooms and um, the offices, engineering, the equipment. 
So um, all of this was new. Um, there are still displays here. Cardinal Gibbons with Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Father Mike McGivney, um, founder of the Knights of Columbus. Here he is again. This is a picture of the laying in the cornerstone, July 7, 1806. A picture of Mother Mary Lang. Mother Mary Lang um, emigrated here in the 1820s from Haiti, what is now Haiti. Um, she taught slave children in her home. Um, she was really encouraged to um, uh, start a ministry, and she founded the first order of black nuns in the country. Um, she also founded St. Francis Academy, uh, which is still in operation today. I don't know if you've ever heard of St. Francis on Chase Street okay. Powerhouse powerhouse school, yeah. but okay. none of the local schools will play football with them because they're <laughs> so powerful. But anyway, that's still in operation today. Um, and she is up for sainthood now. She's not been beatified. She's no, just she hasn't. Been. So venerable, I venerable. believe. Venerable, yeah, okay. And this just happened. So her cause, and also Michael McGivney, their causes for canonization for sainthood are open. Okay. And they're, they're moving along pretty well. So we now officially need uh, a miracle or two. Uh, from Mother Mary Lang, so okay. it's time for people That's to start praying step. for miracles. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that would be a wonderful gift to our, our local church. Absolutely, so, wow. and they just opened the school, Mother Mary Lang Correct. School. Yeah, Mother Academy. Mary Lang School on Martin Luther King Boulevard. You could probably yeah. see it if you wanted to head back that way. Yeah. But, uh, so it's a. Uh, that's an archdiocesan school for uh, for city youth, and it's named after Mother Mary Lang, who did wow. so much to help with education in our city. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, picture of Blessed Teresa of, or Saint Teresa of Calcutta. Now, uh, the centennial of the uh, cathedral, um, and uh, when we had two other visitors, uh, Con uh, Nicholas of Constantinople is in a picture, and uh, Cardinal Keeler in that wow. picture. So all of this is new with the bathrooms. This picture was just discovered um, by Bob Ryer, right? Do you remember Bob? Did you I never met him. You no. never met him here. He went down and picked it up in a truck. They were looking for this picture. It came over in a shipment in like the 1600s. I'm not really sure of the whole story. Um, it needs to be restored. A group of nuns had it for a while, and then it went like to a yard sale, and he discovered it yard down sale. in Virginia and went and picked it up. It needs to be restored. Um, but the estimate to restore it was probably about forty thousand dollars, I think. So it's, it's, it's on gonna, our it's on our list. It's on the list, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out of yeah. The yeah. <laughs> you don't want to write us a check, huh? <laughs> okay, we can go back up these back stairs and then you'll see, get a feel for where you are. So just like that, we've made it back up and to the end of the door. Thank you so much. I'd love You're to just welcome. share a little bit about the life of the church here and if people might be in the area or they want to know more. Sure. So yeah, you, you all have spent this time uh, touring a very historic church, uh, a very beautiful church, but a church that is also very much alive uh, in the, the present moment here in Baltimore City. We take our place, uh, our, our service to Baltimore City very seriously. Um, I know, uh, Austin, you had talked about, you know, your videos try to focus on truth and goodness and beauty. And those transcendentals are really the heart, I think, of what makes the Basilica such a gift to our city of Baltimore. Um, our lives are grounded in the truth of Christ. And uh, from that grounding and that relationship mm -hmm. in the truth of Christ, we try to get beauty and goodness right. So uh, what does that look like? Our liturgies and our music program, which we talked about, are beautiful. And yeah. we try to, you come here and you're in this space, uh, your heart and your mind gets raised up to someplace else and you can focus on higher things. And uh, we take that seriously. We do a pretty good job at it. But also goodness, right? The work of love, the work of charity. Uh, in particular here at the Basilica, we have two uh, initiatives that I think are very uh, unique and special to us. The first is we pass down in the crypt past our uh, perpetual adoration chapel. So for Roman Catholics, uh, we uh, are you know, convicted that Christ uh, himself is present in our sacraments, uh, most especially uh, in the sacraments of the Eucharist. So we have uh, the Blessed Sacrament exposed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in a special adoration chapel. And folks from all over the Archdiocese of Baltimore come here and they take an hour and they pray for, in particular, our city. Uh, and this is a work of devotion to try and help uh, the city of Baltimore, which has so many of its own struggles, uh, to, to heal and to recover and to find peace, right? Um, also, we're really blessed and fortunate here at the Basilica 
to have an urban missionary program for young adults called Source of All Hope. Okay. And so young adults, uh, usually in their 20s, come to Baltimore from all over the United States. They live in community and they spend their weeks uh, being formed in the ways of Christian discipleship, but then also taking uh, the love of Christ that they find in the Eucharist out into the streets. Wow. And they, uh, in a very special way, try to establish long-term relationships with the homeless. Uh, so in Baltimore City, you'll find all kinds of outreach programs. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities to go and serve meals to the homeless. Uh, to help the homeless find beds, to do job training, but all of that's fairly short term in terms of your sort of relationships, your interaction with the homeless. The source missionaries really try to invest like the whole of their lives in the lives of the poor, and uh, they get to know them, and they come to love them, and uh, it's a beautiful gift. That is beautiful. So, um, so the source of all the missionary program is very much alive, uh, and uh, you know it's 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 a gift to the city uh, and a gift to our parish and. Uh, you know, to see authentic Christian witness out there yeah. in the world uh, is a special, special thing. So, yeah, we're just very, very blessed to have them here. Let's look at it. Absolutely. Well, thank yeah. you for all of your work, oh, not just welcome. in this tour, but for the city as well. Sure. This no, has been wonderful. No, we love it. We love it. We love our city and we love our Basilica. Hey, you made it to the end of the video, and I just want to say thank you so much for sticking around and watching this whole video. It was an absolute pleasure for me to get to do the tour, and I hope watching it was at least half as fun. And I want to say real quick thank you to two groups of people for making this possible. First of all, to the folks at Basilica. Please go ahead and check their stuff out online if you want to visit them. I'll put links down below. They're doing amazing work there, and a huge thank you. So if you want to leave a comment thanking them, go check them out, donate. All of those things would be absolutely fantastic. Without them, this video wouldn't happen. And another group I want to thank are my patrons who give to help this channel keep going and growing. They are the ones that allow me to take the time to make videos like this. And if you want to see more videos like this, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this one. I know I did.